150 years ago, Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, introduced many new concepts to the consciousness of humanity, among them the concept of the oneness of humanity, that we all belong to one human race. The love and the trust and the friendship is necessary in order to move on with an ever-advancing civilization. The expectation of love and trust is very natural and universal in many human relations, inclu including the relationship between parents and children, teachers and students, even community members. What I find to be very unique about the Baha'i concept of love and trust is the relationship, this love and trust that exists between the Baha'is and their elected councils and government and in order to elaborate, in order to understand this fascinating new concept further, I would like to introduce to you my distinguished guest, Honorable Judge James Nelson. Judge Nelson has served on the National Elected Council of the Baha'is of the United States, the National Spiritual Assembly, as we call it. Welcome, Judge Nelson. Thank you, Kima. And I would like to ask you, Judge Nelson, um, how significant it is, the concept of love and trust, in the view of the Baha'i concept of government and community? Well, to us, Kayvon, it's essential because trust in governance is necessary to preserve unity. Right. Uh, the government is really supposed to foster, to succor, and to preserve unity among the uh, governed. And if you start out with distrust of government, as is the case in most uh, Western uh, countries anyway, then you start out uh, at a disadvantage because uh, there are some that will trust, some that will distrust, there will be pros and cons and divisions. And the Baha'i electoral process, the Baha'i system, is calculated to base its governance on trust of the institution not necessarily the individuals that make up the institution, but trust that the consultative process, which as it is at the basis of every uh, Baha'i government, uh, will do what is best for the whole and not cater to one faction or another. And so we find ourselves delighted in the Baha'i administration uh, with the reciprocity of love and respect between the government and the governed, if you will. Our Baha'i institutions, as you know, are all elected. There is no individual uh, leadership in the Baha'i faith. That is to say, no individual has power. That uh, all power comes from the people through elected institutions, which uh, use the process of consultation to make this work with love and to, pre to uh, preserve unity. Mm, okay. Having uh, love and trust and recognizing it is important is one thing. How do you create it and how do you maintain it? Well, first of all, you have to establish it as a principle that a government which is not worth trusting is not worth having. And uh, therefore, the process by which the government is established must be a unified and unifying process. Thus, the Baha'i elections are done without nominations, without campaigning, uh, without all, all of the folderol that goes with most political campaigns. And they are done in a spiritual atmosphere. That is to say, the responsibility for the election of the uh, delegates or the officers of local assemblies or national assemblies is not upon those who wish to be elected, because nobody wishes this, but upon those who are going to cast their ballots. So the electorate itself must inform itself as the qualities and characteristics of those for whom they wish to cast their ballot. And then without uh, in secret ballot, without nomination or campaigning, the votes are cast, counted, and those that receive the highest are elected. And then who decides what are the responsibilities, like in the regular form of government we are familiar with, we, the um, people who elect the voters, will say, this is what I want you to do for me, this is what I want you to do for me. So w how do they, these government um, uh, people who are elected, the councils or institutions, know what to go for? Well, you see, <laughs> we do this too. I mean, 
we, there is provided in, in the faith for consultation at local uh, gatherings uh, wherein the body of the believers or individuals may say, this is what we would like you to do. But the person who is elected is not responsible to the electorate to do that. The person is, is responsible to the benefit of the whole so that uh, to preserve unity in the community, all of the consultative process is to do what is best for all. Now, some very fascinating and wonderful ideas come forth from individuals in the Baha'i process. And they are given to the local assemblies, they're given to the National Assembly for consultation, and many of them find their way into action. But you can't, it's not a lobbying kind of situation. It's a, the worth of the idea is what carries the day, not how many uh, constituents you've got behind you that want uh, this particular thing. That's not to say that the voice of the majority is not heard, because quite often lots of people want the same thing. So what happens to this whole uh, energy of adversarial um, system that we see that really mm, the, the way we see it, they are all justified, is because they are uh, bringing new ideas. So what happens to that? Well, in, in what we know as our political system in Western democratic countries, is that uh, you get what you make enough noise or cause enough trouble to get. And this, pr this brings about opposition from the other side. In the Baha'i system, it's quite the opposite. Those ideas which are beneficial to the whole percolate to the top and are uh, put into place and then fine-tuned according as to how people see they work. This makes a reciprocity of love and respect between the elected and the electors. Mm -hmm so that the lines of communication are always open. And you don't feel that if you tell one person this thing, uh, it will go nowhere, whereas if you tell another person this thing, you will get uh, your work done. And uh, the, those that are elected are bound to keep in touch, too, with what are the feelings, the, the wants of those people whom they're elected to serve. I, I understand that. Um also within the context and concept of the Baha'i one, oneness in the Baha'i faith, there is no boundaries as such between people, Baha'is in one country and the other. They work together and they look after each other's... Not only that, the, the same system applies in every country. Wherever they're Baha'is, the electoral process is the same. The principles under which the communities operate are the same. Their loyalties are the same. As a matter of fact, if an issue is global, the, the local assembly sitting uh, in a, here in a, in a city in California will just as well consider the interest of the entire body of mankind as they will the people that are living next door. Which I, that brings it to uh, really close to me as a person, to my heart, uh, because I remember when I was um, many years ago when I was in Iran, and we always had this... Um, issue with the rights, the human rights of the Baha'is of Iran. Yes, of course. Uh, how helpless I felt, and I'm sure everybody else felt, in the situations where we were subject to persecution. There was nothing that we could do, nothing that could do to, for anybody to hear us. And the, the, the thought and the feeling that there would be Baha'is outside of Iran that could hear us and reach out was very special. So I see that that cooperation also exists between Baha'i communities throughout the world. Very much so. Uh, this empathy that uh, the Baha'is feel for their beleaguered brethren in Iran and in some other Muslim countries uh, is shared by people who are not Baha'is mm -hmm. because it's such a pure issue. That is to say, you can see that the Baha'is, bound as they are by spiritual principle, not to interfere in the uh, secular government of their country, not to oppose it or to try to undermine it, yeah. simply do their best to be good citizens of the country wherever they are. Now, we sitting here in America can look at the Iranian Baha'is and say, why are they being persecuted? Uh, they're doing their best to uphold uh, that uh, very government, and yet the government turns around and imprisons them and executes them yeah. in some, some cases and deprives them of all sorts of basic human rights. And this cry is uh, not alone heard by the Baha'is of the world. It's heard by their, the governments of where they live, by the peoples around them, because it represents a pure issue of religious persecution. 
And um, as I understand, there has been many attempts on behalf of the Baha'is of Iran, from the Baha'is of the world, especially from the United States, to um, speak up on their behalf and um, see if we can protect their rights. Absolutely. Our own Congress has passed six unanimous congressional uh, joint resolutions mm. uh, condemning the deprivation of the human rights of Baha'is in Iran. And uh, other countries have done so too. Uh, parliaments in, in Germany and uh, in the European countries, parliaments in Asia have done the same thing. And I understand that there has been a display, a particular display in um, Washington, D.C. that you were uh, present. Very interesting, yes. We, uh, we were able to uh, uh, talk with uh, the people in the rotunda, having seen the display that we put up in the Cannon Office Building uh, just a few months ago and which stayed there for two weeks. The purpose was to uh, allow the story of the defense of the rights of uh, the Baha'is in Iran to be told to the American people. Which um, we're going to uh, give uh, our audience a chance to see a footage of that video, which I remember you were also present and you were speaking. I'm sure they'll enjoy seeing it. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and um, watch the video and then when we come back, we'll continue our conversation. Good. In Washington, the National Spiritual Assembly accepted an offer from the Congressional Human Rights Caucus to mount a display entitled Defending Religious Liberty in the rotunda of the Cannon Congressional Office Building, just across the street from the Capitol. Well, Mrs. Uh, Tom Lantos gave the National Spiritual Assembly the suggestion to have the exhibit in the rotunda. And when we received that idea, we jumped on it. Representative John Porter, a longtime friend of the faith, arranged formal sponsorship. The rotunda is a noble edifice. It has loftiness, it has nobility in it, and our message is about a very noble and lofty theme. The circular exhibit moved through the early history of the Baha'i persecutions in Iran, highlighted the wave of intense persecutions following the Iranian Revolution, documented congressional responses, actions of the executive branch and other national and international agencies, introduced the Baha'i community in America and around the world, and concluded with a moving portrayal of religious freedom as a sacred trust of civilization. The National Spiritual Assembly attended the opening and hosted a special reception to honor two distinguished members of Congress for their devotion to human rights. It is my pleasure to present, on behalf of the National Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States, to Representative Gilman, the Baha'i Humanitarian Award. My work with the American Baha'i community over the years has been extremely gratifying to me. I've always regarded the Baha'is as a special people because despite the hardships, despite the oppressions they've endured over the years, the Baha'is have been able to maintain their commitment to tolerance and understanding among all people. And it's been a genuine pleasure have been able to work with members of the Baha'i faith in our nation and elsewhere on human rights issues affecting members of the Baha'i faith. Fifteen years ago, the American Baha'is, through their elected administrators, came to the United States Congress in anguish and in hope. For the government of Iran had initiated... Judge a James Nelson, chairman of the National Spiritual Assembly, expressed appreciation for congressional efforts on behalf of the Baha'is in Iran. Iran. Hearings were held, facts were found, great bipartisan support was mustered, and six concurrent resolutions demanding an end to the persecution in Iran and the emancipation of the Baha'i community there 
were passed. We now return in gratitude for this continuing support. As chairman of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, Mr. Hamilton unfailingly championed human rights and helped... The second Baha'i Humanitarian Award was presented to Representative Lee Hamilton. Your continued leadership in the fight to end human rights and human rights abuses in Iran and your efforts for world peace are an inspiration to me. I pause for just a moment as I came up here to read quickly that marvelous display that you have put into the foyer here of the Canon Office Building. And it gives us in a very quick thumbnail sketch of the history of your community and the suffering that they have endured. So you do me great honor tonight by giving me this award but really it is I who must honor you because you have set the pace for us and set the example for us in holding up human rights, fighting for human rights, and world peace. Thank you very, very much. As shown in the exhibit, many congressmen who have been involved with the Baha'i search for human rights in Iran, and the tragedy of the Iranian Baha'is has drawn us closer to this second branch of government in a way that I think was truly not envisioned uh, even a short time ago. So we stand with you. We want to continue to work with you. Uh, we know that resolutions won't make a difference in and of themselves, but pressure, public opinion, uh, national focus, uh, raising the issues in every single form uh, will make a difference. And we believe uh, that the people of the Baha'i faith, uh, who, as I said, are people of peace, uh, good citizenship, uh, community involvement, uh, are people that uh, share the values uh, that this country stands for, and we should stand with them every single moment. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> The Voice of America was also present, providing coverage for its worldwide radio broadcasts. Uh, there were people from the State Department, there were people from the press, and there were many representatives of the various human rights organizations. People from the American Bar Association who deal with international relations and human rights, and uh, from Amnesty International, from many organizations. The exhibit and reception represent a culmination of nearly 15 years of concentrated effort to build relationships with the political and human rights leadership in the United States. The fruit of this work is evident in the ongoing commitment to protect the persecuted Baha'is in Iran and in the growing respect being paid to the Baha'i community and the teachings that guide it. Welcome back to Transforming Human Consciousness. We're going to continue our conversation with Judge James Nelson, distinguished member of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States. We were talking about the um, footage or the display, the rotunda of the Capitol, and the situation and the rights of the Baha'is of Iran. I understand that mm, this is not just an intellectual, distant kind of a thing for you, at least you have traveled to Iran. Yes, yes. Before the uh, Islamic Revolution in Iran, in fact, just before it, mm -hmm. my wife and I traveled to Iran and met with some of the people who were subsequently executed, and many of them who lost their privileges to work, their ability to buy food, many of whom uh, uh, were caused to flee and some of whom have come here. And the tragedy of the whole thing is that had there been an understanding of how beneficial these people were to the society in Iran, you know, how well respected they were as people, how much they contributed to the well-being of the country, and how loyal they were to its interests, uh, none of this could have happened. And it's just the the case is one of pure religious persecution, as I said before. 
And the exhibit in, in the rotunda is a testimony to the fact that our Congress has seen it so. Because this is not a religious exhibit. You don't have religious exhibits in, in the no. rotunda of office buildings of the United States Congress. This is a testimony uh, of our government to the fact that this is a case of outright violation of human rights right. and which our government is happy to, to oppose and to defend. So it, uh, every time I think of those lovely faces, you know, with whom we dined and with whom we laughed right. in Iran and with whom we shared these wonderful principles of loyalty to government mm -hmm. and of effective service as being really worship. Right. Uh, it it uh, saddens me. There was a, I, I wanted to ask you, there was a mention that um, the Baha'is are always law-abiding and they support their government. At the same time, they don't participate in, in the party politics. Uh, how is the balance? I mean, how, how, and that is true all over the world. Yes, in the United yes. States, anywhere. Sure. So how, how do Baha'is mm, support their government without being part of the politics? Uh, they, they simply do what they believe is right. And they don't seek to undermine uh, the government itself. Where the government deserves uh, their support, they give it wholeheartedly. And uh, they never try to uh, Fight it or use their, their uh, power to overcome Yet. Is that the principle with, with the faith? The principle of the faith is unity. That uh, if you start being divisive, that is, if you fight one faction against another, uh, you're on a slippery slope to disaster. That uh, the, the purpose of human life is to get together as people. So if you see something unified. wrong, if you disagree with something, so no, what no, do you no, do no. It doesn't mean we don't protest it. Yeah. Uh, and in this country, of course, we have the delightful right to be... Uh, uh, heard uh, in our protest, but uh, we won't throw bombs about it, and we won't kill people about it, uh, and we won't serve to be dividers about it. So really, anywhere in the world, any government in the world will not have anything to worry about, uh, from the at least from the Baha'is? Absolutely uh, not. In fact, in the Baha'i writings, uh, we are charged as a matter of spiritual principle to be the well-wishers of government. And it seems like this whole, this whole attitude of love and trust that we're talking about is reflected in all these dimensions towards the government, from the government, back and forth. So I was going to ask you, um, having served on the National Spiritual Assembly for all these years, how did you feel loved? Did you feel loved? Oh, oh yes. And in a way that's quite interesting. Let me state for you a contrast. Um, I was a member of the judiciary in, in this state for 26 years. Right. Now, no one feels loved in governmental positions, I think, right. in American uh, life. It is just not the state of affairs. There's this tension or hostility between government and people, and, a, and an enormous amount of distrust, as it's as if, if we don't stop them, government will run off and, right. and do terrible things. The fact that it's the opposite in the Baha'i faith is what is the uh, magnificence about it. The first way you feel love as a member of a Baha'i institution is the frankness with which the community talks to you. Right. You see, one of the thing that f one things that goes on in families is they will tell you their deepest uh, feelings right. and their heartfelt sympathies what they will share with you. Right. This is the way it is in the Baha'i community. The Baha'is will tell you how they feel right. and they'll be honest about it right. because they know you're not going to get back at them or something if they say what you don't want to hear. There's nothing that a parent doesn't want to hear from a child. If a child has a complaint, they want to hear it. Right. If the child is distressed, they want to know it. And so it is with Baha'i government. Uh, the, the system doesn't work well at all if we're not well informed as to what the people uh, need and, and wish. And of course, the matter, matter of individual love among the Baha'is is, is legendary. I mean, you always feel accepted and protected and... Uh, we often, I remember we often, you have the firesides, um, the information gatherings at your home every Wednesday. Oh, sure, I have that, and they happen at other homes too. And for all these years. And everybody walks in there, and I 
have heard so many times um, people saying, oh, um, but this is the judge's home. Just walk in there just like yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope that they do. Just walk in there just like that because, uh, you know, this, this is the welcoming embrace of unity. Mm. When you know that the human beings are the same at heart, doesn't matter what color they are, or what language they speak, or what country they come from, they are in search of love and unity and harmony. And it's nice to know that the religion for today has given them a glimpse into how that can really come about and uh, not be the source of division and strife. Hmm. This is wonderful, and it's heartwarming to be able to mm, have that, trust that, be part of that in this day and age where mostly it's difficult to find somewhere to trust. It makes an optimist of people who otherwise would be pessimists. Yes, yeah. yes. I really don't know how to thank you for this really special occasion to be able to um, have you and to be able to see the, the video of the rotunda and, and uh, visit with you. Thank you so much for coming, Jake Nelson. And for our audience, thank you for being with us, for transforming human consciousness. If you have any questions or any comments about the show, please contact us through Baha'i Faith, PO Box 686, Claremont, California. Our phone number is 909-626-2569.